The following Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Mike Riddle and is entitled Science and the Bible. For a free catalog of all of our Bible study DVDs, CDs, audio tapes, and books, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. Uh, thank you very much. I had to whisper in Bill's ear there, and he used a uh, heretical term there. He said ex-Marine. <laughs> so we get into this creation-evolution argument. There's an awful lot of arguments out there in creation-evolution. But we need to understand it's really not a battle about science. It's a battle about world views. Some people choose to believe God's word as their starting point. And that is a worldview that in the beginning God created and that God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die on a cross. That is a worldview. The other worldview is called materialism. And one of the parts of materialism is evolution. That is the belief that there is no supernatural. Everything that exists in the universe is called mass and energy. That means it is a direct attack on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the churches need to understand that. These two are diametrically opposed. You cannot have a foot in both camps. The Bible makes it clear what a double-minded person is. But what we need to understand is both creations and evolutionists do not have separate sets of evidence. We don't have evidence that just creationists look at and evidence just evolutionists look at. We have the same evidence. We deal with the same facts. We deal with the same science. So what is the difference? It's your starting point, your worldview. See, the problem that we have is this, especially in the churches. Many people in the churches today are saying, oh, the scientists, they have all the answers. Well, wait a minute, where'd God, what happened to God? The Bible's not relevant today. It was written a long time ago. And what we find is our youth today lack confidence in the Bible's history. There's a logical disconnect there. We will go to school and we learn about science and how things really work. Let's not worry about what happened in God's word in the history. So what happens is our students believe that God's word is outdated. It's not relevant anymore. We have that logical disconnect. We see the Bible's history is nothing more than fairy tales and stories. You see, our foundations are under attack. Our foundations are under attack. In the beginning, God created is under attack. For in six days, God created everything is under attack. The worldwide flood is under attack. The authority of God's word is under attack. And that's what we're about in Answers in Genesis. We use creation ministry as our main focus. But what we're about is upholding the authority of God's word beginning in the very first verse. We will not compromise his word with man's wisdom. We're seeing a different worldview, a different history. The world tells us this is the real history. That about 13.7 billion years ago, there was this big bang explosion. And from that big bang explosion came all the stars and galaxies, and then the plants, then all life. And here you are, you're the product of an explosion. That should make you feel very good about yourselves. Something exploded, and here you are. But the Bible teaches a different history. Let me show you the history we're going to be showing in our museum. We call it the seven seas of history, that in the beginning God created everything in six days. And then the second sea is called the corruption, the fall. The third sea is called the catastrophe, the flood. These are real historical events, not myth and not allegory. Then we have the fourth sea, the confusion, which explains better than anybody else can explain by man's wisdom. The Bible explains why we have different languages, why we look different. It's called the Tower of Babel. That explains why we can look different, not racism, as comes from evolution ideas. And then we have the fifth sea, which is Christ. The sixth sea, the cross, and the seventh sea, the final consummation. That is the real history. You will walk through this history in our museum. But folks, if you take away our history, we have no foundation for the gospel. We sing that great hymn out there, I love to tell the story, but how many people here can tell the whole story? See, if you don't believe Genesis is real history, you don't have a story to tell. Because the whole reason Jesus Christ went to the cross is founded in the book of Genesis. And if that is not real history, if Genesis is just an allegory, then we have a different God. Because what we have is God sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die a horrible death on the cross for something that never really happened. What kind of a God do we have now? And that's what we hear coming out of many of our so-called Christian universities. The history isn't real. Well, we're sending our students to these Christian universities and they're coming out not believing the Bible anymore. 
our history is being attacked. We're shooting at all these things we should be shooting at, abortion, school violence, family breakup, pornography, racism. We're shooting at all those. Those are wonderful things to be shooting at. But while we're doing that, they're tearing our foundation out from underneath us. Almost every one of our Christian doctrines starts in the book of Genesis. Our foundations are being pulled out. But what we need to be doing is shooting at their foundation, materialism, evolution. That is the ideology that man's wisdom sets truth, not God. Every one of these, abortion, school violence, pornography, all have their roots in materialism, evolution, man's wisdom. That's what we need to be shooting at, the foundations. Oh, but Mike, Mike, the battle is really between science and the Bible. No, it is not. The battle is not between science and the Bible. Who created all the science? God did. And God is not in a battle with himself. That means the science, the true science, will always support his word. And I'm going to go through 10 areas of science that will give you the confidence to show that God's word is true beginning to end, and his science supports his word. And let's start with the origin of the universe. Where did it come from? Again, we're told about 13 to 15 billion years ago, there was this Big Bang explosion that occurred. That's a nice story, but the question I have to ask is a foundational question, and it is, where did the matter come from to create that Big Bang? Because you cannot have something go bang until you have something that can go bang. And that is an impossible answer for the evolutionist. Let me show you what some of them have to say. Martin Rees, PhD researcher in cosmic evolution, explains it this way. Our universe sprouted from an initial event, the Big Bang or fireball. That did not answer the question. He ignored the question. The question is, where did the matter come from to create that Big Bang? The evolutionists will do whatever they can to ignore that question. Why? Because they have no foundation. Here's another gentleman, PhD astronomer, wrote a book called The Ultimate Universe. He's an evolutionist. In the very beginning of the time and space we know, all the matter and energy of the universe, as well as the space within which it would later expand, was contained as a single point. Did he explain where that single point came from? No, he didn't. He ignored it. You see, we have a foundation. We have answers. We know who created it. We know how it was created. We have somebody who did create it. It's called God. Folks, you know what comes from nothing? Nothing. And you also know something cannot create itself? That means the universe cannot be eternal. It could not create itself. That leaves only one possible option, and that is in the beginning God created. There are no other options. You see, when we look at the science, the Bible has the only true scientific answers. The evolution answer, they don't have one. They start with the matter. You cannot do that. That is false science. Joseph Silk, an astronomer and an evolutionist, wrote a book called The Big Bang, and he gives an honest answer. And he says, it is only fair to say we still have a theory without a beginning. That is evolution. Folks, we have a beginning. It's called, in the beginning, God created. He is a self-existing eternal being, and that does not defy any science because God is transcendent from his creation. He stands outside of his creation. He is not bound by his creation, but he can enter into it, and he did in the form of Jesus Christ. But the universe is governed by the laws of science and must adhere to all the laws of science. And since that's all that evolution allows, they have no answer. And this is the only answer. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is the only logical and scientific answer where that original matter came from. So when we look at the score sheet, the Bible, the biblical worldview, has an answer. Evolution does not. Well, let's go to number two. This is the great confusion we have in our school systems. Operational science versus historical science. Operational science is science we can observe, we can repeat. It's how we sent people to the moon. It's how we build our jet engines. It's how we do our medical research, things we can touch and feel. But that often gets confused with something called historical science. Those are things that happened in the past. And we must make assumptions what happened back there because we cannot repeat it. We did not see it. For example, fossils, do they exist in the present or the past? In the present, because we can pick those fossils up, we can look at them, we can do tests on them. But how they got there is historical science, and we need not confuse the two. You know where we find most fossils today? This, this is amazing. This, this just might blow you away, where we find most fossils. In sediments laid down by water. 
Any, any reason how all those fossils got there and sediments laid down by water all over the earth? Just a, how about a thought here this morning? How about a worldwide flood? See, the data does match the Bible. Now, I want to do some operational science for you. Let's look at real operational science, see if it really confirms the Bible or the evolution worldview. Anybody know what dogs produce? Dogs. Does that amaze anybody? In other words, dogs always produce dogs. Has anybody ever seen a dog produce a dat? No. No, no cat dogs. Anybody know what cows produce? Cows. Even on the moon, they would produce cows. Cows always produce cows, just as the Bible teaches. Anybody know what cats produce? Cats. You're getting pretty sharp out there. Cats. How about horses? Horses. No matter what they look like, they produce horses. How about chimpanzees? Does this surprise anybody that chimpanzees always produce chimpanzees and never a person? <laughs> now, when we look at the operational science, it always confirms the Bible. What we can actually repeat and re-perform and observe always agrees with God's word, never evolution. Now, if evolution is true, we should find some amazing transitional creatures out there. We should really find some transitional creatures. Let me show you what we never find. We never find the zebra. <laughs> we never find the tiger bunny. Where are these transitions? How about the birdfish? <laughs> we simply don't find them. Or the cat cow. How about you bird lovers, the sparrow boxer? <laughs> or how about the tiger owl? How'd you like to have one of those in your finger? Then a face only a mother could love, or a butter cat. How about the catrilla? <laughs> How'd you like to take one of those home with you? See, we simply don't find the transitions in the fossil record. What we find are pictures drawn by artists in textbooks and assumptions, but never the real evidence to support evolution. So when we look at the score sheet, when we look at operational versus historical science, operational science always supports God's word. Now, how about the Bible and science? Is the Bible a science book? No, it is not. Aren't you glad? Because we constantly change our science books. But when it talks on science, it has never had to change. How often does evolution change? Sometimes every year, sometimes every week they're changing their mind. But the Bible has never changed. For instance, Isaiah 40, verse 22, talks about the sphere or the circle of the earth. Over 2,000 years ago, the Bible taught the earth was round. It's never had to change, has it? Jeremiah 33, 22, in science, talks about the host of heaven. It says the stars are too numerous to count. We didn't know that until recent history, but the Bible taught it thousands of years ago. Let's take a look at how many stars are out there. We estimate there are about that many stars out there, about 26 trillion stars. Did you know if you started counting the day you were born, counted a star every second till you were 100 years old, you would still be in the low billions? The stars are too numerous to count, just as God's word says. 100% accuracy in science. Leviticus 11 taught about medical cleanliness and sanitation. We could have saved a lot of lives in the Civil War and in the hospitals. We'd have read the Bible, learned about sanitation, medical cleanliness. A lot of lives could have been saved. Leviticus 18 tells us we're not supposed to marry our brother or sister or close relative. It was not man's invention. That was God's invention against incest. So man didn't invent that. Romans 8, 22. Do you know the Bible teaches physics? Whoa. Well, it should because physics is fun, isn't it? How many people here think physics is fun? Yes, physics is fun. It's got to be fun. You know what the Bible teaches? That the whole creation is in decay. That is the second law of thermodynamics. The universe as a whole is wearing down. It's in decay. The Bible taught that 2,000 years ago. It took us until recent history to figure that one out. The Bible is 100% scientifically accurate. How about biological stability? The Bible teaches every creature is created after its kind. God gives us the ability to vary within kind, called genetic variability. Just look at the person next to you. Don't they look variable? See, we have over 200, 300 different flavors of dogs. Flavors of dogs, yes. Go to Thailand, they're flavors. <laughs> Look at all the varieties of cats we have. They're all cats. 
varieties of horse, we're all horses. People, how many races do we have in the people? One, it's called the human race. It's called the Tower of Babel, the confusion, the fourth C there. That's why we look different. You see, if you go to the Bible, you understand this. Does the Bible use the word race? Yes, it does. It says, run the race to the finish. But the Bible never separates people by skin color. It's always by nations. You see, race is an evolution concept, and we need to get rid of that concept. It's one people, one race. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches, genetic variability. So when we look at the Bible and scientific accuracy, it's 100% accurate, but evolution is constantly changing their story. So let's go to number four, the origin of life. What can we say about that? I open up these biology textbooks, and here's what I read. Out of Ken Miller and Joe Levine, one of the more popular biology textbooks in this country, this is what they're teaching. By recreating the early Earth atmosphere, ammonia, water, hydrogen, and methane, and passing electrical spark, lightning, through the mixture, Miller and Urey proved that organic matter such as amino acids could have formed spontaneously. Folks, they're deceiving our youth. Absolutely deceiving our youth with that kind of a statement. Let me show you why. The problem of oxygen. Notice in that quote that these experimenters left oxygen out of their experiment. Why do they leave oxygen out? Because we need oxygen to survive, but at the molecular level, oxygen is like a poisonous gas. It literally destroys molecular bonds. So life could never start in the presence of oxygen. So what they try and teach our students is, back there in history, there was no freestanding oxygen in the atmosphere. Well, that's a wonderful story. But you know what happens when we take all the oxygen out of the atmosphere? We also take something very important out of the atmosphere called the ozone, made of oxygen, O3. You know what happens when we take that ozone away? We all become instant crispy critters because the ultraviolet rays of that sun will just come down and fry all life and all molecules. So life cannot start with oxygen and it cannot start without oxygen. So what are they teaching now in the schools? Now they're teaching we crawled up out of the oceans. Life started way down deep bottom in the oceans. Down there we have those hot thermal vents and springs that supply the, the energy to drive the chemical reactions. And that is a wonderful story too. Because as soon as they make that statement, Let's go get a basic chemistry book and open that book up to a page that talks about hydrolysis. Hydro, water. Hydrolysis means water splitting. See, water, again, is necessary for life, but it is one of the worst places in the universe for life to begin because water literally destroys molecular bonds. So life cannot start with oxygen, without oxygen, or in the water. You know there's no place left on this planet or any other planet. It's beginning to look like there's only one final solution. It's called, in the beginning, God created. But that gets ignored. Who is really teaching science now? Not the schools, not the evolutionist. But here's a, here's a real killer. I have a question. If water destroys molecules, and you're made up of molecules, what's going to happen the next time you take a shower? You should come apart, shouldn't you? You should be going down the drain, but you don't. Why doesn't the oxygen tear you apart? Because of one very important concept is called every one of your cells has protection around it called a membrane. In other words, for evolution to really work, the first thing that has to happen is that protection has to evolve before anything else. Now, why would evolution do that? Because evolution cannot see into the future. It has no foresight. It has no idea why it would build this complete membrane, which is, incidentally, very complicated. Why would it build a cell membrane and it has no idea what to put in it? See, the very first thing that has to happen is that membrane to protect all the ingredients inside. That never gets taught to our students. The cell membrane has to be first. So when we look at the origin of life, just a very simple one. It agrees with the biblical worldview that the only known way we can get life is it had to be created. There's no known way to how we can get that first cell by naturalistic processes. So let's go to DNA. You didn't know we were going to get into all the science. DNA and information, they go together. Let me give you a quote, and this quote is nothing new. This is nothing new. This is by Lane Lester, PhD in genetics, and Ray Boland, PhD in molecular cell biology. Nothing new here. DNA is an information code. 
DNA is information. There's an incredible amount of information in that DNA. John Sanford, PhD in genetics, makes this statement about DNA. There is no information system designed by man that can even begin to compare to DNA. I want to show you what he said there. How many computer people do I have out here? All right. How many computer engineers? Anybody computer engineers? You know how we describe computer engineers? They're different. <laughs> but I have up here what's called, this is a picture of a 340 gigabyte hard drive. 340 gigabytes. What that is, it's something about this size that can hold 340 billion pieces of information. We must be supremely intelligent to do something like that. 340 billion pieces of information on something this size. We are really smart. Well, let's take a look at DNA. You know DNA, the information DNA is more compact than what's on that hard drive? You know how much more compact? Five billion times more compact. We're not so smart after all, are we? John Jogue McFadden wrote a book called quantum evolution. He is also an evolutionist, and here's what he has to say about this. A billion universes, each populated by billions of typing monkeys, could not type out even a single gene of this genome. Was that, that old excuse, give me a billion monkeys and they'll type out the, the first line of Shakespeare. Folks, it won't happen. That's a false argument. It is called bluffing. It is not real science. Werner Gitt, PhD in physics, one of the top information scientists in the world, makes this statement. There is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. In other words, information never, ever arises by naturalistic processes. If you want information, it always requires an intelligent source. So what can we conclude then? Since the density and complexity of the DNA encoded information is billions of times greater than man's present technology, we can conclude the coder of the DNA information must be supremely intelligent. In other words, who, whoever put that information in DNA has to be smarter than anybody that has ever lived on this planet. And that leaves only one solution. It's called a creator god. Because the information only comes from an intelligent source never by naturalistic processes. So when we look at DNA information, we look at the science. The science supports the biblical worldview, not materialism. Well, let's talk about the age of the earth. Have you ever noticed each one of these topics could be easily taken to an hour? So you're going to get 10 hours of information in 50 minutes. That should be a new record for these conferences. The age of the earth, what do we know? Well, let's start here. Are long ages necessary for what we observe? That's a simple, basic, neutral question, isn't it? Now, evolution requires billions of years of time. That is a requirement for their model. But are the long ages really necessary? Well, let's look at here. Here's a picture of Mount St. Helens before 1980. Wonderful scenic view. And there's Spirit Lake there. Wonderful lake for fishing and boating. Let me show you what one day can do. That's one day. That is not millions and billions of years. One day, and that was a small volcano. Also at Mount St. Helens, we have some canyons there. There's a canyon there we've nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon, about 140th the scale model of the Grand Canyon. Has some of the same geologic formations the Grand Canyon has. Now the question is, how long did it take to make that canyon? The answer is easy, one day. Oh, wait a minute, Mike. How do you know that only took one day? That's very easy. One day it was not there, and the next day it was. <laughs> that means we have observable or operational science to support that large canyons do not take long periods of time. We also go to Mount St. Helens. We see another canyon there. We look at these sides of the canyon walls around the world. We see they're made up of many thin layers of sediments, many thin layers, sometimes only millimeters thick. And the normal interpretation is each one of these thin layers take a season or year or years to lay down. So if you look at this canyon by Mount St. Helens, count up all those layers, you'd assume this canyon is about 10,000 years old, and your answer would be absolutely wrong. It took one day. See, in 1980, it laid down all these sediments. Then in 1982, another eruption occurred and carved this canyon out, and there were all those sediments that had been laid down in one day. 
Sedimentation does not require long ages. It can happen rapidly. Are long ages necessary? You know how long it takes to make oil today? Today we can make oil simulating natural processes in one day. It will not solve any potential energy crisis because it takes a lot of energy to do this. But the fact and the operational science support, it does not require long ages. Coal, simulating natural processes. We can make coal in one week. Petrified wood, you can go to the internet, go to the US Patent Office, get the chemical ingredients and the patent number for turning wood and petrified wood in one week. Stalactites, we've actually observed stalactites growing one inch a year for over 10 years. Stalactites do not take a long period of time. It's just the process. Diamonds, you ladies have diamonds on your fingers. Don't want to wreck anything here, but we can now make extremely good diamonds in one day. So those things you have on your fingers are not that old. Then we have carbon-14. Carbon-14, I want to talk a little bit about that. Carbon-14 is an interesting, interesting atom. It decays very fast. All living things get carbon-14. Why? Because we eat and breathe. Carbon-14 is in the atmosphere. Plants take it in, in the form of carbon dioxide. We eat and breathe it. So all living things have carbon-14 in them. Do rocks eat or breathe? No, they don't. Therefore, they really won't have any carbon-14 in them. So what, living things have carbon-14 in them. So you're constantly taking carbon-14 in you, but carbon-14 is constantly decaying out of you through radioactive processes. So you're taking it in, and it's decaying out of you. Now, once you die, do you eat or breathe anymore? Now, that's, a, that's, that's not a loaded question. No, you don't eat or breathe anymore. So once you're dead, once something dies, it no longer takes carbon-14 in it. But the carbon-14 continues to decay out. After, about, after something's been dead about 80,000 years, there's no really datable carbon-14 in a specimen. So 80,000 years is about the maximum dating range for carbon-14. But if we were to find something with carbon-14 still in it, we would assume it's been dead for less than 80,000 years. And that is observed. We can repeat those experiments. These are very good experiments we can do with carbon-14. Now let me take you to the ge geologic column, the evolutionary time scale here, and just divide this up into three periods, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic. And notice the time periods the evolutionists use on here. The Paleozoic goes back to about 543 million years. Now these ages are very interesting, and this is what they teach as a fact in the textbooks. I want to show you something very interesting about this. And what I'm going to show you is these ages are not based on any real observable science. Carbon-14. Now carbon-14 should all have decayed out of any living substances after about 80,000 years. Now coal is supposed to be millions of years old. Millions of years old. Coal is organic. There should be no carbon-14 in coal. Well, coal samples were taken from 10 locations and all contained measurable amounts of carbon-14. We took coal samples from all up and down this geologic column, and in every single sample, carbon-14 was still there. What does that mean? The results indicate the entire geologic column cannot be millions of years old. This confirms the Bible and challenges the evolutionary idea of long ages. Now, the geologic column can only be thousands of years old, not millions. And this is repeatable science. Every sample of coal we take, regardless of the area in the geologic column, still contains carbon-14, meaning that column cannot be old. Diamonds are supposed to be billions of years old. We did the same thing with diamonds. Now, diamonds are a very special kind of rock. They are pure carbon, pure carbon. Billions of years old, there should be no carbon-14 whatsoever in these diamonds. They're so hard, you can rule out contamination. Twelve diamond samples were chosen from different locations, all contained measurable amounts of carbon-14. Diamonds cannot be older than 80,000 years. That is repeatable science. Conclusion on carbon-14. Christians should not be afraid of radiometric dating methods. Carbon-14 dating is really the friend of Christians who support the biblical teaching of a young earth. What are the evolutionists doing about this? They, they know about this. They are ignoring this information. They will not bring this information into the education system. You need to arm yourselves. We have packs of books out there that contain a book called The Answers Book. You can buy three books and get The Answers Book in there 
and we have an entire chapter that covers all of carbon-14. And in that chapter, we use many of the evolutionists' own journals to support what we're saying here. So when we talk about the age of the earth, it supports exactly what the Bible teaches, that God created everything in six days about 6,000 years ago. There is absolutely no science to support millions or billions of years. It is all based on historical science assumptions. Well, let's look at the mechanism for change, mutation and natural selection. This is where Charles Darwin comes in now. Here's the evolution scheme. We look at the geologic column. We find the least complex creatures on the bottom. The more complex as we go up the column, and we have this biological change or diversity happening over millions and millions of years. That's a nice story. But what they forget to tell our students is all that change requires something called information. Information. In other words, if a reptile is going to change into a bird, new genetic information must be included into the DNA to tell that creature to stop making scales and start making feathers. Where does information come from? Well, let's take a look at these things called mutations. What do we know about them? Well, we know mutations can be detrimental, they can be neutral, they can be beneficial. There are some recognized beneficial mutations. But what do we know about detrimental mutations? They cause disease, sickness, and death. You know what we know about dead things? They don't evolve. We have neutral mutations, which cause no change, no evolution there either. So this is the only possibility for evolution now, beneficial mutations. If we get a beneficial mutation, will that allow for evolution? Absolutely not because it has to be a beneficial mutation that adds new genetic functional information. No one has ever been able to observe one of those. The best they can do is antibiotic to resistance. The bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotic, but folks, they're deceiving your students there too, because no new information happens there. No new information happens there either. It's called information is the key that word predominantly gets left out of the school textbooks. Lee Spentner, PhD in physics, MIT, taught information communication, John Hopkins University, writes this, but in all the reading I've done in the life sciences literature, I've never found a mutation that added information. John Sanford, PhD in genetics, amazingly there are still no known mutations which unambiguously create or add information, not even the ones that are considered beneficial but our education system ignores the science to protect evolution. Natural selection. Will natural selection allow for evolution? Well, is natural selection true? Yes, it is. As Christians, we must believe in natural selection because it is a fact. We observe it all the time. It's our ability to adapt to our environment, survival of the fittest. But can natural selection cause one kind to change into another kind? And the answer is absolutely no. Why? Because natural selection never adds anything new. It only selects from what already exists, and in many cases it causes a loss of information, but never a gain in information. So when we look at mutations and natural selection, the mechanism for Darwinian evolution, it does not support evolution. It refutes evolution and supports exactly what the Bible teaches. God created every creature after its kind with genetic variability. Well, let's go to the fossil record then. That's a big one we see in our textbooks, used to support evolution. Here's your typ typical fossil record again. Least complex on the bottom, more complex as it go up. But if we go down to the very bottom, two layers. I love to go after foundations, because that's what they're doing to us. We need to go after their foundations. Where'd the matter come from? Can't have Big Bang till you have matter. But when we go to the fossil record, you gotta go down to the very bottom. You can take care of the entire fossil record in less than six minutes. Don't think any longer than that. Now, I know there's books this thick out there for the fossil record, but you don't need to go there. Go to the foundations. Go down to the bottom two layers, pre-Cambrian and Cambrian. If you can't remember those two names, just say the bottom two layers. What do we find at the pre-Cambrian? Single cell organisms, single cells. Then we move up to the next layer, the Cambrian. What do we find? Very complex creatures like jellyfish, seashells, trilobites. Now, according to Darwin evolution, I'm going to put a chart up here. On the vertical, I have the timeline. On the horizontal, I have something called morphology. Hmm. That's kind of a new one of those words there. I have a question. Anybody here have morphology? Raise your hand if you think you have a case of morphology. Nobody. Nobody. Okay. Well, if you don't have morphology, you're a blob. Morphology means shape. 
Now, I understand that some of you do not have morphology until you've had that first cup of coffee, but that's a whole nother sermon. So we have morphology on the horizontal, then I have a dotted line separating the Precambrian and Cambrian. Now, according to Darwin evolution, we start with this single cell. Now, wait a minute now. I never let them go there. I'd like to know where that first single cell came from. See, they just skipped billions and billions of steps. I'd like to know where that first cell. I don't let them go to any biological change until they get their first cell. Don't let them skip over things as if may, waving a magic wand and skipping things. But if Darwinian evolution is true, we get this tree of life branching off from this single cell. If evolution is true, we should find single cell, which we do. We should find two cell, 10 cell, 100 cell, 1,000 cell, million cell creatures out there everywhere in the fossil record. But the fact, what we actually observe is this. We find all these fossils in the fossil record fully formed and functional and absolutely zero factual transitions. All we find in the textbooks are alleged transitions drawn by artists. If evolution is true, we must find millions of transitions and we simply do not find that. So now I'm going to give you a quiz. Now I'm going to let you know you've had teachers in your past but I'm going to be the meanest and toughest teacher you have ever had. Why? Because I require 100% for passing. And if you don't pass my quiz, we will have a little session afterwards doing push-ups. <laughs> yes, you guessed it. I was Marie. So let me start you off this quiz. There are 12 questions. On the left is a fossil turtle. On the right is a living turtle. What does a fossil turtle look like? A turtle. Does that surprise anybody? Okay. There are some fossil spiders. What do fossil spiders look like? Spiders. Okay, on the left is, according to evolution, a 400 million year old starfish. On the right is what a living starfish looks like. What does a fossil starfish look like? Is this amazing anybody yet? There on the left, according to evolution, is a 50 million year old fossil bat. What does a 50 million year old fossil bat look like? Looks like a bat today. There is a, on the left, a fossil crab. What does a fossil crab look like? Crab. There's a fossil shrimp. Anybody know what a fossil shrimp looks like? Certainly doesn't look like a whale to me, does it? No, looks like a shrimp. On the left is a fossil dragonfly. What does a fossil dragonfly look like? Dragonfly. There's a fossil horseshoe crab. You know what it looks like? Looks like a living horseshoe crab. On the left is a fossil seahorse. And amazingly, that still looks like a seahorse. On the left is a fossil jellyfish. You know what a fossil jellyfish looks like? A jellyfish today. Now here, I might get you on this one. There are some pictures of fossil frogs. You know what they look like? Frogs. <laughs> it's not hard to tell the difference, is it? Now here's a good one. On the left, According to evolution, this is a 400 million year old fossil fish called a coelacanth. You know what a 400 million year old fossil coelacanth looks like? A coelacanth that lives today. This must be the dumbest fish that ever lived. 400 million years and it never knew how to grow legs. <laughs> Did anybody see any evolution in any of those fossils? Absolutely not. No evolution there. The fossil record confirms the Bible, that God created everything after its kind with genetic variability. So let me go to the human body now. Let's talk about us for a moment. I have some good news for you. I have some very good news for you. That is not your relative. You may have brothers or sisters that look like that, but they're, they're I don't know. I won't go there. But I want to let you know, this picture we find in textbooks is an illusion. It is not based on any observable science. Let me show you that God programmed genetic variability into us. There's Billy Barty, famous actor. He's died a number of years ago. Three foot nine. Was he a human being? Yes, he was. 46 unique chromosomes. Here's another person called Shaquille O'Neal. Seven foot one. Is he a human being? Yes, he is. He's a big one, but he's a human being. 46 chromosomes. Look at the genetic variability God programmed into us. We can be small, we can be big. We look at gorillas, tremendous genetic variability. There's a male gorilla skull, and there's a female gorilla skull. Look at the difference in species that live today. Both the same species, gorillas. Genetic variability. Oh, but Mike, 
We're very close to these apes. We're only 3% different than the apes. Don't be trying to determine which one's the ape, which one's me up there. They used to say 1%, then 2%. Now they're saying about 3%. And that is wrong also. See, evolutionists were not doing good science. They were only looking at part of the DNA. Now that we've looked at more of the DNA, it's closer to 6 to 8% different. So they're not telling our students the truth anymore. They're dealing with something called evolution. But folks, I'll just take with 3%. 3%, that sounds like we're real close to the apes. But when you actually do the numbers and try not to deceive people, 3% is 90 million differences. They don't tell our youth that. They make it sound like it's real close. It's not close at all. You could have 10 billion years, you won't even come close to making that difference up. You could have 100 billion years, it won't happen. But folks, we're about 6%. That's 180 million differences. We need to get back to teaching good science in our classroom. I want to show you the amazing complexity God made us, the eyes, the human eye. Blinks about 400 million times in a lifetime. See millions of shades of colors. It would take a supercomputer years to simulate what takes place in our eyes in one minute. And we think we're smart. Tears wash our eyes every time we blink. Eyelids protect our eyes from too much light and help keep the dirt from blowing into our eyes. That's called design. Our best supercomputers cannot model this. Somebody smarter than anybody that's ever lived had to do this. The eye is unique to our creator. He formed the eye, shall he not see? Look at our ear. The ear has a million tiny moving parts in it. Contains parts for hearing and helping us keep our balance. Over 100,000 tiny little hairs in there. Don't try to shave them off either. Uses a level of technology no science has been able to attain. We take a look at the ear, three parts. We have the outer ear, which catches the sound waves. We have the inner, the middle ear, where we find the eardrum. The three smallest bones in the body are found there. But then the most amazing thing. Now, this, this might be too amazing. I don't, I'm not sure you're ready for this amazing part here. This amazing part. When we go to the inner ear, what happens is the inner ear takes those sound waves and converts them into electrical pulses so the brain can understand them. That is absolutely amazing. It's a technology no one can do. In other words, your ears and your eyes are no good without your brain. It's amazing the complexity God built into us. It's called design. Proverbs 20, verse 12, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. We take a look at a heart, weighs about 10 ounces. One pound, 16 ounces. Next time you pick up a 10 pound or 10 ounce box of Cheerios, that's about your heart. Human heart pumps about 2,000 2, gallons of blood. Pick up a gallon of milk, 2,000 of those go through your body every day. Human heart beats about 100,000 100, times a day, about three and a half billion times in a lifetime. And how often do you have to oil it? That's called design. Blood vessels, the human body has about 1,500 miles of blood vessels. In other words, if you stretch yourself out, you go from Seattle to San Diego. That's inside your body. We can't build things like that. That's called design. We look at our brain, 100 billion neurons or nerve cells in, inside your brain. Each neuron is connected to thousands of other neurons by synapses. There's your real superhighway. There are about 5,000 million, million, million possible ways for linking all your neurons together. That's inside your brain. That makes the internet look terrible, doesn't it? Information storage. Brain contains about 300 miles of nerve fibers. Storage capacity, about one quadrillion bits of information. Wouldn't it be nice if we could remember it all? The real superhighway, starting from a fertilized egg, on the average, about 250,000 neurons are formed every minute for nine months. That is amazing. It is estimated the brain can perform a thousand million million computations a second. That makes supercomputers look pretty archaic, doesn't it? It's called design, not random chance. Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what we need to be teaching our students. So when we look at the human body, the biblical worldview is true. Let's go to the last one. I want to finish with the Bible here. The Bible. What do we know about it? The accuracy of content. We look at the manuscripts in existence. 
that confirm the Bible's truthfulness. We look at the accuracy of prophecy, 30% prophecy in the Bible, 100% accuracy in prophecy. No other religious book in the world can match this. Accuracy of archaeology, not one archaeological find has ever disputed the Bible. There's things we haven't found yet, but 100% accuracy in archaeology. The Bible has withstood all opposition for all time there. People have tried to burn it, ban it, and outlaw it, but all those people, I'll give you the track record, they're dead and God's word remains unchanged. They've tried to add books and subtract books from it, but it remains pure. They're trying to tell us it's not relevant today, but it is. It's scientifically accurate. They've tried to compromise it, tried to put a big bang explosion in billions of years into the Bible. But once you do that, you're teaching death before sin. And that's a major problem with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've tried to mock God and his word. We see that happening today but the track record will be the same for them too, folks. God's word will remain unchanged. But you know the most amazing thing about the Bible? His word, it continues to change lives. And it can change your life regardless of what you've done because his mercy and his grace is bigger than anything you have ever done. God bless you. <laughs> this has been Science and the Bible presented by Mike Riddle. To receive a free catalog of all of our Bible study DVDs, CDs, audio tapes and books, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach, call 800-977-2177 24 hours a day or on the web at compass.org.